Last year we had General Campbell do this, and he was great. But uh, this year we were blessed to have Frank Larkin with us. I don't know if some of you know Frank, probably one of the most distinguished folks around government in the last 30 years. Um, started off in DOD as a, really as a SEAL. Spent a lot of time in the law enforcement community, the Secret Service. Most recently and most notably, he was the 40th United States Senate Sergeant of Arms. And, and probably most notably now, he's our Vice President for Corporate Development and a really great man. Frank, come on out. Good morning, everybody. So I was out of the room when they drew the straw for uh, doing this job. Uh, about six months ago, as Mark alluded, I came on board to NS2. I was up on the hill. I figured it was time to get a new adventure. Uh, last, this past month, this past four or six weeks, only confirmed that it was a good decision. I won't go anywhere. <laughs> I won't say anything more than that. But uh, again, thank you, Mark. And uh, again, we have a, uh, a great program ahead of uh, us today. Uh, a lot of thought-provoking leaders, hopefully uh, somewhat provocative in some of these areas. Uh, so let me get some uh, business out of the way here, and uh, we'll get going. Again, welcome. This is our seventh annual uh, event. Uh, I encourage you to uh, download the, uh, the application uh, that is available on the, uh, on the site. Again, that'll give you the, uh, the insight on the agenda and also give you a forum to ask questions of uh, the panel. I also encourage you to go outside and visit our uh, NS2 forum, uh, or I'm sorry, our innovation uh, area. We have a, uh, a number of folks out there with different technologies. Uh, a lot of our affiliates and sponsors are represented there. Again, a good way to network uh, during the break and, and the lunch hour and uh, see some of the uh, new technology that, again, I, I think, you know, a large part of why we're here. I want to give a, a special shout out to the Fairfax County Police. Uh, they're here today in both uniform and uh, undercover capacity to uh, help provide for our safety and security. So a uh, round of applause for our <laughs> men and women in blue. Let's go ahead and silence those phones. You don't want to be the center of attention, uh, you know, in the middle of one of the panels. So again, if you could uh, silence the phones and any other electronic devices that you hauled in here, it will be great. So without further ado, I would like to uh, introduce our first speaker. Again, Mark alluded to him, Bob Wark, our 32nd Deputy Secretary of Defense, a Marine Corps veteran, and currently now uh, very heavily engaged in a lot of consulting work with his own company, Team Wark. Bob, I'd like to welcome you to the stage. Wow, big crowd. Good morning, everybody. You know, usually I would like to start off with a joke, but, you know, when I was the Deputy Secretary, everyone used to laugh at my jokes. Now. I can't tell a joke, and, no, and I mean, nobody laughs. So the big uh, lesson is become the deputy secretary and people will laugh at your jokes. Uh, but when Mark asked me, hey, uh, Mark asked me to give this uh, presentation, I said, what do you want me to talk about? And he said, I'd like you to kind of start off by an overarching view on what the Department of Defense is really aiming for. And I really applaud this because this is a time of enormous technological change. But all too often, we get focused down into the technology for technology's sake, and we kind of forget what the destination or what we are actually trying to do. And when we started Project Maven, we had a very big debate inside the department. And I said, the last thing we can do is to have Project Maven be viewed as an intelligence program. This is a pathfinder for a new way of war. And we called it the Algorithmic Warfare Cross-Functional Team. Now, every now and then you see that in the press, but everyone quickly goes to Project Maven. And it begs the question, just what is algorithmic warfare? What is the Department of Defense aiming for? And I believe that it is going to be the basis for the next military technical revolution. 
Now, as you read some of these words, a military, the big thing to remember is a military technical revolution only happens every so often. And it is a period of sharp, discontinuous change that renders obsolete the basic way that everyone is fighting war. That is the key determinant on whether a revolution has occurred. Now, they arise from changes that is profound and destabilizing on the battlefield, the use of technology in different ways. And it could be in a concept of operation like blitzkrieg, it could be a specific technology like nuclear weapons. Uh, but all of these things really have these sharp changes and they often occur with broader political changes like the Napoleonic uh, Revolution. Sometimes they're referred to as revolutions in military affairs and revolutions in war. Now the most recent revolution occurred in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s and I refer to it as the battle munition, I mean the guided munitions battle network revolution. On this side is a picture of what everyone was thinking of in the 1970s. Airland battle, follow on forces attack. You would use airborne sensors like paved mover. You would download it to a fusion center. The fusion center would crank all the data. It would give information to missiles and to air with guided munitions and would attack targets very, very deep. On the right hand side uh, of the chart, is a Soviet conception of what they called a collision of reconnaissance strike complexes. And the Soviets actually envisioned this revolution before we did. Without question, it occurred, and it rendered obsolete unguided munitions warfare. If you were stuck in the unguided weapons warfare regime and you went up against one of these large battle networks that could throw dense salvos of guided munitions 24 hours a day through all weather, you were toast. You were just a series of targets. So it rendered obsolete everybody who wasn't really in this regime. Now as the guided uh, munitions battle network revolution matures, force design, how we design the force in the Department of Defense and operations are going to be inevitably shaped by two broad trends. And the first is the increasing lethality. Um, these theater anti-access area denial networks, what that means is Andrew Marshall used to say, look, a, a uh, revolution matures when both sides have the technologies. They might not use them in exactly the same way, but they're close enough for government work. And right now, our great power competitors, both China and Russia, have battle networks that are as uh, excellent as our own, and have guided munitions that they can throw as far and as densely as we do. We've never been up against a competitor that can do that. And it will immediately make all warfare more lethal at the theater level. And you're going to have precision attack everywhere throughout the battlefield. Mortars will be guided. Artillery will be guided. Rockets will be guided. Soon we're going to have guided rifle rounds. You know, sooner or later we're going to have a 50 caliber sniper rifle with a guided round. And precision attack will be everywhere. And what this shows is, as the circular or probable, it's just a measure of accuracy, gets down to one and two feet, the size of the warhead you need goes down dramatically. So you're going to have a lot more precision and they're going to be relatively small weapons, but because they're so accurate, they will be devastating. Now, the second is rising personnel costs. Now, I just pulled these data down. We have good data through 2014, 2015. It's constantly changing. But the Department of Defense personnel, the red line, it keeps going down. The military health care system keeps going up. And CBO says that in 2014, it was $99,000 a year on average for every active duty soldier, sailor, airman, and marine. That was a 31% jump from 2000. And they predict 215,000 per person by 2030. Now, commercial industry has already figured this out. And they know that you're going to have to go to automation. You're not going to be able to field millions of people 
when they cost like this, you're going to inevitably go to unmanned systems. And right now, for all the unmanned systems that you see about, the Predator drones, everything, they are essentially in their operational infancy. We're still learning how to use them in operations. And the relentless advances in technology, which is going to be the subject of the panel on the five key technologies that Mark talked about, all of this is driving these unmanned systems to smaller and smaller and smarter and far more capable. And you name it, IoT, uh, advanced computing, more powerful algorithms, big data, AI, it's just pushing this big broad trend of unmanned systems to smaller and smaller systems. So the hypothesis is that the next military technical revolution will occur when a key competitor, probably one of the great powers, goes towards ubiquitous use of autonomous unmanned systems and machines. Now these definitions are taken from the Defense Science Board summer study on autonomy. And autonomy is what it's all about. It's not, again, it's not the unmanned system itself. If you have to control all of your unmanned systems, that's going to be a burden. What you want them to do is take autonomous action. And what you're doing is delegating decision-making authority to the machine. Now, a system that has prescriptive rules and prevents absolutely no deviations is automated. It's not autonomous. Andrew Ng, former CEO of Baidu, says, if you, it is an operation that takes a human less than a second to think about, it should be automated. We have the capability to do that now, and that gives you a sense of the scale of things you might be able to do. And this is what we really mean when you delegate decision-making authority. We are not talking about Skynets, and we're not talking about Terminators. Those are what you would call an artificial general intelligence uh, type weapon. We're looking for narrow AI systems that can compose courses of action to accomplish the task that the machine is given, and it can choose among the courses of action. So, missile, go out, kill a tank. The missile's going out. Soon you're going to have algorithms that say, wow, there's a SAM system, a surface air missile system over here. I'm going to have to guide to the west. Uh, we have terminal systems here. We have a whole bunch of tanks. Wow, this one tank looks like a command tank. In my computer library, that means I should attack it first. It figures out how to best attack it, a top, top attack or not, and it does it. That is a good thing. It's a totally autonomous weapon, and it will do what it's asked to do. It won't say, hey, I woke up this morning and I decided I want to shoot down an airplane. A general AI system sets its own goals and can change them. No one in the Department of Defense is saying we ought to go towards those type of weapons. We want weapons that can compose and select among courses of action. Now, improved autonomy is going to be the natural result of machine intelligence. We always use artificial intelligence, but I think machine intelligence is more accurate. And in me, to me, it's very simple. It's the programmability to process information, and this is key, to make decisions as well as, or better than, human beings, and faster. This is all about delegation of authority to make decisions. That's the key thing. If it can't make decisions as good as a human, then move on to the next thing. It will imbue all unmanned systems with various levels to perceive and abstract and learn and reason. This is from DARPA. Some of them will do reasoning really well. That's going to come later. Some of them are going to do just perceive, learn, and execute a plan. And what that does, as algorithms improve and computer power improves, and you have ready access to abundant training data, wow, you're going to have something that all of us are really going to be surprised, in my view. Now, this machine intelligence is going to empower new term, uh, ways of intelligence systems. Again, this is a DARPA, uh, this is a DSB, excuse me, Defense Science Board definition. You apply machine intelligence to a particular problem or domain. Again, artificial narrow intelligence. And so the system is going to be trained 
to operate within specific bounds of a defined knowledge base. And interesting enough, DSB really helped us on this. They said, conceive of these systems as either autonomy at rest or autonomy in motion. And autonomy at rest is virtual. It's in software. It's decision systems. It's helping analysts. It's inside the computer, whereas autonomy in motion will have a presence in the physical world in terms of robots and autonomous vehicles. So it's this broad move towards machine intelligence, which will give us artificially narrow intelligent systems that are reflected either in systems at rest or systems in motion. So there is no definition of algorithmic warfare. This is my attempt to try to sum up what the department is trying to do. There's going to be universal digitization. There's going to be everything is going to be connected and everything there's going to be data that we can't even think about. So the, the internet will become the intelligence internet of intelligence things. And there's going to be widespread use of machine intelligence in both systems and rest and motion. And the key thing, what we're looking for is human-machine collaboration, which I'll define in just a second, human-machine combat teaming, and machine-to-machine -machine combat teaming. And all of these will make our battle networks extraordinarily more powerful. And they will displace battle networks that do not have artificial intelligence systems inserted inside them. And the hypothesis is it will allow us to make decisions more rapidly, have more relevant combat decisions, and we'll be able to apply discrete effects faster and more precisely than ever before. So, uh, Amir Hussein, author of The Sentient Machine, and General John Allen, now the president of Brookings, uh, a Marine, they refer to it as hyperwar because it, war will go so fast. And Mark Milley, the current chief of staff of the Army, refers to these as wars of cognition. So human-machine collaboration is using machines to make better human decisions. Human-machine collaboration. The human is always in front in terms of DOD thinking. And someone said it's combining the human strategic guidance with the tactical acuity of a computer. There's going to be human-machine combat teaming, which is going to be cooperative operations between manned and unmanned systems. You're already starting to see an early part of this. Un loyal unmanned wingmen with uh, manned aircraft. Paul Kaminsky says the first phase will see you'll have unmanned aircraft operating with a single F-35. And they might be able to do one of six things. Jam, uh, fire missiles, um, sea decoys, whatever. And all the pilot will do is say, unmanned wingman one, I want you to jam. Unmanned wingman two, I want you to do active radar. I'm going to go silent. Unmanned wingman three, be prepared to fire missiles. It'll be relatively easy to do that. You won't need a big architecture because they'll only have one uh, to five or four, four or five or six modes. But when you combine those together, all of the data shows us that we've done on the analysis is if you take an F-22 and you go up against a Chinese J-20, which is their uh, stealth fighter, the exchange ratio is not all that great. And that's not good for us. But if you insert unmanned systems, then the exchange ratio becomes dramatically favorable for the United States. And that's why it's important that we get there before the Chinese. Machine to machine combat teaming is all the swarming and collaborative attacks. Seven missiles screaming in on a, uh, a surface action group. And all of the seven missiles are talking to each other and they're all looking out into the battle space. They say, okay, here are the type of radars they have. One missile goes high, becomes an active radar system all the other uh, missiles stay silent. One of the missiles decides to uh, attack from the west at sea level. 
Another missile decides to attack at sea level from the east. Two missiles decide to go high and dive in at supersonic speeds, all designed to overwhelm the defenses of the surface action group. That's going to be relatively easy. We're testing that now. So when you add all of these things together, we really do believe this is going to be a revolution in military affairs, a military technical revolution. And make no mistake, we are in a race. This reminds me a lot of the interwar period. Everybody knew that there was mechanization going on. Everybody knew that advances in aviation were happening almost on a monthly basis. And everyone knew that we had the radio. But only one competitor put all three of those things together into an operational concept called Blitzkrieg. And it gave the Germans an incredible operational advantage in Europe for about two or three years until the Soviets and the United States and the Brits said, hey, we can do that. Uh, in fact, we can do it better. And so by 19, uh, 1944, the Germans were being out blitzkrieged. But the key thing is, this is a time of enormous technological flux. Yes, each of the technologies are important. What's more important than quantum? Well, I don't know. Maybe it's the Internet of Things. Well, what about, bit, uh, what about uh, blockchain? What about um, artificial intelligence? It all combines to this algorithmic warfare. And that is what the Department of Defense is trying to do. Now, everybody here in the audience is helping in one way or the other. You might be working on an algorithm. You might be working on new types of data. In this uh, era, data becomes the fuel of algorithmic warfare. Every day, 2.5 exabytes of data. I can't even, it's hard to conceive. I asked somebody to tell me what it was like, and I can't remember whether he said it was one or two days, but um, he said, and I've got to check this out, but it sounded really cool, so I'm going to tell you. He said, okay, if you took pieces of paper, if you took 10 to the 18th bytes, 10 to the 18th numbers of piece of paper, and you stacked it up, it would be an astronomical unit, the distance between Earth and the sun. And I said, that can't be true. And he goes, no, it's true. I said, well, who measured this? I mean, you know, this must have been some NASA geek, you know, he's saying, oh, man, let me figure this out. And it sounded so astounding, but it is astounding, the amount of data that we have. And in the past few years, you all know this, more data has been created than the past 5,000 years of recorded human history combined. So a lot of you were working on data, how to do it. A lot of people are thinking about how do you weaponize the data. This is going to be a bad thing, especially right now these societal and governance cohesion attacks that are being thrown at us right now are generally a couple humans and a bunch of software bots, pretty stupid bots. Imagine if you had AI that was behind these types of attacks. So everybody's thinking about data solutions, machine learning, and analytical insights. This will empower autonomous, uh, autonomy, intelligence systems, and will lead to a truly revolutionary period in warfare. And, I might say, a revolutionary period in economics. A lot of people believe that economic, uh, algorithm, algorithmic economics is going to lead the fourth industrial revolution. So I applaud everything that you're all doing. This is a time of enormous change, and make no mistake, we're up against the most difficult technological competitor the United States has ever faced in China. They have a vibrant technological ecosystem. They're putting a lot of money towards all of these systems. I think you all know their national plan for AI can be summed up in this way. Catch the United States in the West by 2020, surpass the United States in the West by 2025, and be the world dominant leader in AI by 2030. And the first mover in a technical revolution always has advantages. The only question is how fast they can be duplicated. So thank you all for what you do, uh, both for your companies, 
but more importantly, what you're doing in the national security space for the United States. This is a competition we all need to be aware of, and we all need to win, and God bless you all.